Café Scientifique is a monthly series of expert-led discussions on science and culture presented by the Bell Museum of Natural History. For more information about the Bell Museum or to find out about upcoming Café Scientifique programs, visit bellmuseum.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you. Usually we start over on that other mic, so I, I threw a monkey wrench in it already. Um, thank you guys all for being here at CAFE tonight. Uh, my name is Leah Peterson, and I am the Adult Programs Coordinator at the Bell Museum of Natural History. Is there anybody here tonight who's at their first CAFE ever? Oh, wow. Just three, four people, five people? That's great. Do maybe a half dozen? Thank you. Welcome, welcome to CAFE. We're so happy to have you here. Has anybody, does anybody ever get up like around six o'clock in the morning <laughs> on a Monday and turn to KFAI, which is our wonderful um, all volunteer public radio station that broadcasts right out of the West Bank and Cedar Riverside neighborhood? That's, you guys should start doing that. <laughs> Not a single person, Zan. <laughs> um, if you're interested, we always do a cafe, a special cafe interview on KFAI. Um, the numbers are 90.3 in Minneapolis and 106.7 in St. Paul. Um, but the Monday before every cafe, uh, Zan Holston, who's here in the second row, is gracious enough to um, have me into the studio to talk about um, what we're doing for cafe the next Tuesday. Um, and that airs at 7.45 on a Monday morning during the Morning Blend drive time radio show, uh, which is every Monday through Friday on KFAI from 6 to 8 a.m. But Zan only hosts on Mondays, so if you're gonna tune in any day, start with Monday. Uh, without further ado, I wanna hand the mic over to our curator of exhibits, uh, colleague, and my mentor at the museum in many ways, Don Luce. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Leah, and thanks for coming tonight. Um, I assume that most of you have been to the Bell Museum and not just to the, mo the movies, right? Okay, good. And so <clears throat> you do know that these dioramas are, uh, depict wildlife and scenes in Minnesota for the most part. And so, uh, and we are moving. We have a new building under construction and we will be moving many of these dioramas to that new building. And, uh, and that moving process itself is going to be quite a technical challenge. But tonight, pr I'm actually gonna be focusing on that moving that Minnesota a little bit more metaphorically in that we are gonna take these really incredible gems uh, from the early 20th century and we're going to try to reinvent them and move them into the 21st century and to make them accessible and um, relevant to current and future generations. And so that process a little bit is, is really the, the key of what the talk will be tonight. And what I'll do, I'll set the scene a little bit by showing you some uh, dioramas and why they're so special at the Bell. I'm gonna give you a little history of dioramas, very thumbnail history, and then talk a little bit about how the dioramas were made and the people who made them. And then uh, sort of a brief history of our past almost 20 years of think, trying to rethink the Bell Museum and rethink Natural History Museums and that process that we went through. And then we'll give you a little bit of a preview of what, the, what they'll look like in the, new, in the new Bell Museum. So that's kind of the, the layout for the, for the night. So the, the dioramas, as I said, this is a building built in 1940, the current building. It was built specifically for dioramas. We have some dioramas that were done in the early 1900s and, and 1920s that were moved into this building in 1940. And then the ones in 1940 through the early 1950s were painted by Francis Lee Jaques. They so, show scenes of Minnesota, and they're some of the most remarkable dioramas. They've been judged as some of the best dioramas in the world. And so this is just one example, the, the moose diorama, painted by Jake Wees. The foreground was created by Walter Breckenridge. And these are scenes, yes, they're, they're, uh, <coughs> um, uh, they're scenes of Minnesota. They show wildlife. 
But unlike most other dioramas in natural history museums, the moose is not just standing there in front of you, posing, sort of. The often you see a moose diorama, and it'll have daddy moose, mommy moose, baby moose, sort of in this family portrait. Totally incorrect, biologically. And one of the key things, both Jack, uh, Jaquies and Breckenridge really knew their natural history, and they knew their art. And the, com the combination of these two made these remarkable exhibits. So here the moose is actually walking into the diorama. And it is, uh, and then you can see, of course, the, the cow and the calf following it. It's a fall rut. <clears throat> you can tell by the background the tr uh, trees are changing color. Uh, and it's, of course, the mating season for, for moose. And that's when, actually, the bull moose would be interested in the cow moose. The rest of the year, forget it. So again, another example. This is an older one done in the 1920s, uh, the beaver diorama. And what they really went into is this whole, they reconstructed the beaver dam, the lodge. They showed the whole sort of social uh, interactions of beaver. You can, you can actually interpret how beavers are impacting the environment from the background painting. So these are not only just really beautiful creations, not just pretty pictures, they really have this incredible storyline. Each one has a storyline that you can get involved with. Now, how did these dioramas come about? So a little history, if you go back to the origin of museums, this cabinets of curiosity in the Renaissance, these were things where people would just collect interesting things. It might be artwork, artifacts, ancient relics, fossils, skulls, uh, items from nature that weren't so easily under explained. So they, they would stimulate curiosity, stimulate this, uh, this idea of just this muse of thinking and imagining and uh, using your imagination and, uh, and thought to kind of figure out what they were. And this is really the origin of museums. And, um, but initially, of course, everybody thought that these were really, and they were primarily places for the wealthy aristocrats to gather these collections. And so if you look at the first museum, and this was very different in the United States. The first museum here was created in about 70, uh, 1790, so soon after the American Revolution, by Charles Wilson Peel. And he had this remarkable revolutionary idea that actually ordinary people could learn and be educated. And he was an amazing person. He was an artist, a biologist, a naturalist. Uh, uh, he, excavated the first um, ma uh, Macedon, so a fossil collecting. And one of the things he did in that museum to make it accessible to people was when he, so if you look here, he, he was also a taxidermist. Uh, and so his birds, he painted a painted background behind the birds to give a sense of the setting, where those birds would come from. And that was, uh, you know, a lot of people trace this back to these might have been the kind of first start of this idea of a diorama, putting the animal into its environment. Uh, unfortunately, this museum closed, so he wasn't per entirely, <laughs> he couldn't maintain this museum. And eventually, these, these exhibits were, were destroyed in a fire. So the next, the, uh, and if you looked at museums later in the, in the uh, in, in the 19th century, so this is 1890s, or this is about 1900, actually, at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. As science developed in the 19th century, became more specialized, became more uh, uh, rigorous, okay? They were very interested in collecting and, f and, and getting a document, do which is really important, a documentation of all this the diversity of nature, okay? Really kind of the essential force part of really studying uh, uh, the world, is what is actually out there, and, and defining that. that. And, it's a, and it's a tough job. And so they were collecting all of these species. This is just the bird hall, OK? So there's case upon case upon case of birds all sitting on a stick, OK? It's kind of getting, it's, it's like getting your ducks all in a row. And they're trying to figure out, are there patterns to this nature? And this a very interesting classification. Okay, but there was absolutely no reference to what these birds were like in the real world, what they were like as, as living creatures, where they lived, or any of that other sort of ecological stuff, which at that time was really considered not science. 
Okay, that was kind of, and so it was, um, it wasn't until a little later, um, well actually it's sort of non-scientists that actually invented the diorama. So these were net more naturalists and artists, this combination of naturalists and artists, science and, and art together, that made this breakthrough. And so this is Carl Akeley's, we heard that name, okay, you'll see a picture of him later. And this is his first diorama. Has anybody ever, ever been to the Milwaukee Public Museum? A few people, okay. This diorama is like a sacred relic there at the Milwaukee Public Museum. They have it as a, it, a little shrine to Carl Akeley, and this is uh, it's often considered the beaver diorama. What's wrong with that? It's a muskrat, right? We all know that it's a muskrat, right? All right, so, but it's amazing because he, the first diorama, he's got the painted background, he's got the taxidermied animals, but he's got the, 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 uh, the muskrat lodge cut in half so you can see inside the lodge. He's got the water level, you can see above the water, below the water. He's got a lot of innovations in this first diorama. And so I just want to say, if you compare that, this is what the scientific museum would have looked like at the same time. This is the Paris Museum, one of the biggest museums in the world. And it was, again, row upon row of birds sitting on a stick, okay, in cases. And what does that tell you as someone coming in who's not a scientist? If you're a scientist and ornithologist, it's an enormous amount of information, very important information that you can gain from those specimens. But if you're just coming in and you're saying, okay, I want to know about birds, what does this tell you? I mean, it's a lot of, a lot of dead birds, okay? And we, we get a lot of, you know, we get a lot of criticism because we have a lot of dead, dead birds in the museum now. Well, just think if the museum was like this. Okay, so it doesn't tell you, so you compare that to this diorama of sandhill cranes at the Bell Museum and what the dioramas were doing, showing those birds in life, in their environment, as they're moving, their display behavior, the type of habit that, that they're dependent upon. And so this is really this breakthrough that dioramas made. And it brought, and it was very much part, and I can, I don't want to go into too much detail. It had to do with the, you know, the idea of evolution, this idea of natural selection, this idea of how the environment was really important, that these organisms were not just set in stone, but they changed, they adapted to the environment. So it was really, and, and then we also were, well, I'll get into this. We, um, these species were not always going to be here, okay? And so people realized that the, at the end of the 19th century, a lot of these species were disappearing. Everybody know what this bird is that they're shooting? Passenger, Passenger pigeons, right. So here was the bird that was the most common species in the world, okay? That it, within a couple decades was driven to extinction. Okay, so this is an amazing thing that started waking people up to the fact that we're having an enormous impact on the environment. So the 19th century, in North America, we went, you know, essentially most of the forests were cleared. Uh, most of the land was turned into agriculture in one way or another. We having a, uh, and hunting, unregulated hunting was devastating wildlife populations. Now, and so people were trying to figure out how do we change people's attitudes. The attitude, of course, was nature was there for our consumption. It was, it was there for us to put to some, per, some uh, use, useful purpose. That wild wilderness was really use, useless. And so there was a big change that, uh, in public attitude that people were trying to make that to, to respect it, this wild nature. And artists played a big role in that. And so this is a painting done by Thomas Moran of the Grand Canyon, and it was these big paintings that were done by these followers of the Hudson River School painters that helped, pe one of the things that helped pe change people's attitudes towards the natural world and start, and so nat national parks were beginning to start at the same time that dioramas were being created. And so many of the dioramas, the, f the, the effort to create these dioramas was the same thing. How do we create this appreciation for nature and for these amazing places in nature. And so many dioramas show, like here, this is a cougar. Now cougars could live on the rim of the Grand Canyon, but probably not their prime habitat, okay? But they were chosen to highlight this spectacular place. And of course the other thing is, 
hunting. Hunting uh, took a big, you know, yes, hunting had an enormous impact on these populations, but there were also people who appreciated hunting as this incredible experience of nature, and they realized they were going to lose that experience if these uh, uh, species went extinct. And so even from our very origins, this is a cave painting 10 plus thousand years old from, uh, fr from France or Spain, and these are people who depended on these animals for food. They hunted them, but they obviously had this incredible respect and admiration for those animals. And that, that connection with the hunters was, it still exists today. And actually, hunters were some of the most important conservationists in this early time period. Now, here's Carl Akeley. And Carl Akeley definitely comes from that kind of a background. A big game hunter, uh, know, knows a lot of big game hunters. Uh, hunts in, in Africa, and so here he is preparing to mount these spectacular elephants at the American Museum of Natural History, and he pioneers this new techniques in, in taxidermy to make them look very, very lifelike. So he's actually sculpting this life-size elephant in clay, and that will be cast in plaster and then molded into a <clears throat> paper mache form, and so this process of creating this form that that elephant skin will go on to. And this is, of course, the, the, those elephants in that African hall at the American Museum of the Hatchery. So these dioramas, at by the eight, 1930s, whole museums were being built just to house dioramas, whole ha you know, halls were built, and these are basically cathedrals to nature. Okay, so these were these areas where you could go in and really you know, kind of worship nature, okay, from a variety of different perspectives. And so this is the African Hall, there would be a North American Hall, et cetera. And the Bell Museum was definitely built specifically for dioramas, the same idea, a sort of a cathedral to nature. And it's also very romantic. Many of these, uh, uh, Leah maybe put some of these pictures in here, because, <laughs> Uh, uh, Jaques, who worked at the American Museum of Natural History starting in the 1920s, he was going, they would send out expeditions specifically to collect material for these dioramas. So this is a painting that he did of the boat he spent almost a year on traveling through the South Pacific and going from island to island uh, collecting material. And then I think, let's see, this is a, a series of paintings. He would set up the scene. They would want to pick this place to show the wildlife. Uh, this is Nuka Hiva, I don't know, you know, in the Marquesas Islands. And uh, he, so he'd climb up to this ridge, set up his easel, do this painting. And that would be his reference for doing the background painting because this is pre-color uh, film, okay? So he couldn't just take pictures as reference. And so just to introduce who these people are, oh, is that better? I, I, have you been able to hear me? I hope so. My ears are kind of plugged up, so it's hard for me to know. Whether. But uh, Jaques, here's uh, Francis Lee Jaques, and he's sitting on the rocks at Shovel Point, which is now Tetagooch State Park on the North Shore, sketching for the wolf diorama. And this is Walter Breckenridge, and he's actually on in the Bounty Waters, snowshoeing, tracking wolves, okay, in the 1930s, okay? So it was this combination of these two people who really created that, uh, this wolf diorama. And I'm gonna just go, kind of go through this process, a little bit of the process of how they went through this. So one of the first things they would do is they would make a little model of the diorama. And so you can see here, uh, Breckenridge would make this clay model of the, of the uh, he made some sketches first, and then um, of the wolves and the orientation in, consul in, cons in consultation with, with Jaques. Jaques made this little sketch on the background. And one of the key things, the illusion, one of the things that made dioramas so effective for the public is it was kind of this early virtual reality. You had this illusion of being in a space and you could use your imagination to put yourself into that place. And this was um, very, very different. You, you know, you couldn't do that with lines of specimens in a case. And so it was that ability to allow the visitors to use their imagination that was so important. And so getting that illusion of that space was really kind of very, very effective. And, um, and to work that out, they would make these little models 
And here's Jaquies. He would have to paint the backgrounds before any of the foreground was in place. So he's standing in the diorama, painting the background. And here's Breckenridge skinning the wolves. And again, at this time, wolves, there was a bounty on wolves in Minnesota. Minnesota was the only state that had a viable population, the lower 48 state that had a viable population. And if you shot them, you got paid. You know, the government would pay you to shoot them. That was uh, try to get rid of them. And these were actually trapped by the Conservation Department, precursor of the DNR, as a way of you know, predator control. And so, um, and then you would make a form, and, he, and here Breckenridge is actually using some of the actual leg bones of the wolf, and it's a, a carved part of the skull, and then he, that was, so he'd model clay onto that to represent what the wolf body would look like without the skin, okay? And then that was mold, the plaster mold to be made of that, and then they would make a, a paper mache, lightweight but sturdy paper mache form that would go in, that the wolf skin would actually be glued to. And so, and of course the eyes, glass eyes would be added, the teeth, the tongue, those are artificial, they'd have to be created. And to try to create this, you know, very lifelike representation of the animal is an art form in itself too. And so here's the, here's the finished diorama. And again, one of the things, the classic <clears throat> Jaquies diorama, and you know, I was just talking, somebody's going to the American Museum of Natural History. Look at, look at, the Jaquies diorama is pretty much the, he has the animals moving and moving into the diorama rather than standing there looking, kind of posing. And it's a, one of the, his big uh, um, uh, innovations. And of course, one of the other things that was really cool about the way the museum was built was that it was built specifically to be used by school groups toured around by university students, okay, in these small groups. And, and so this, the dioramas were intended to be in, uh, personally interpreted, okay, to have a, a, a personal interpreter there. And so this is actually a scene from 1940. The, the, um, the wolf diorama was one of the very first ones that was new ones done in the museum. And um, we actually know who this is. George Riesgard, <laughs> who was, uh, you know, a student at the, uh, very interested in the museum and giving a, a tour to these students. And we still continue that, that tradition today. And so when you, uh, school groups comes to the Bell Museum, they don't just start, aren't just left to run wild. They're broken up to small groups. They're given a, 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 a customized tour by a student, university student. And that student is actually a real great role model we feel for these students who hopefully they will want, get them in, uh, encouraged to, to further their education. And so uh, that's something we hope to continue. We will continue in the new museum. And just, okay, so we talked about the background. We talked about the animals. <clears throat> uh, as you can see here, there's lots of little plants in many of these dioramas. Sometimes I joke, sometimes we have people say, hey, how, who gets in there and waters these things? You know, it keeps those, they, they look so fresh, you know? So this, the, the uh, ability to make those plants is also another incredible, a lot of dioramas have a lot of sort of foliage, okay? There's no foliage in the Bell Museum dioramas. They're all actual, you can identify just about everything in there to the species. And they're made, but they're not, they're made out of wax. All the broadleaf things are made out of wax. All the little flowers and petals are all handmade. All incredibly detailed work. Uh, they would make these, there was molds, plaster molds of the leaves, top and bottom. And they had a little, they'd heat up wax and color it, pour them in there, and close down the mold. And you can see there's an uh, impression of two leaves here. There's a copper wire that's been added to that. In, so you have a big splat, you have a splat of wax with impressions of leaves in them. And then you have to cut the leaves out. And of course, uh, the leaves have serrations, different serrations, different species have different serrations. So this is a little cutter that you could adjust the blades on to cut different kinds of serrations. And then you heat those leaves up, smooth them out, shape them. You'd have to paint 
paint them because that was only the base color. And that, that would get you one leaf, you know, and then you just keep, you know, and then you would, you would take those and solder the copper wires together, cover the wires with wax to make them look like stems. So incredible amount of work went into these dioramas and beautiful work. And the wax, a lot of this is done with plastics today and they do a pretty good job. I actually think wax still looks best, but at any rate. And this is just one example. So if you look at Maple Basswood Forest and uh, those blue, Virginia bluebells there, and, you know, just think about trying to make those out of wax. And, okay, so these are really great things, but there are a lot of people say, well, <clears throat> aren't these dioramas just sort of like really old-fashioned? Shouldn't we just get rid of those dioramas? I, I, <laughs> um, do, do, they, you know, do they teach anything, et cetera? And so <clears throat> this is, um, so I'm just gonna go through some of the challenges. Why dioramas, why shouldn't we have dioramas? And uh, this, this is an artist, uh, work by this artist, uh, Mark uh, Dion, who of course loves dioramas. He does these installations, art installations, kind of based on dioramas. And I kind of say, well, um, you know, when a technology becomes archaic, it sort of turns into art form. So now we have artists sort of making dioramas. Does that mean that dioramas as exhibits are, are uh, you know, archaic? <clears throat> anyway, but you can see here, he's, he's obviously, dealing with some more contemporary issues, you know? And so, you know, how can you deal with these things with dioramas, okay? It just doesn't make sense. So, you know, shouldn't we just get rid of them? So there was a lot of um, uh, dispute about this. A lot of the museum scientists never liked dioramas, okay? They thought there was way too much money spent on these things. They were just pretty pictures, three-dimensional pictures. What do they teach? And so, um, and so periodically you would also have exhibits like this that were really designed by a curator, okay? And it would to teach, you know, basically as much knowledge as possible, put it out there, and these are, in the museum trade, this is a technical term for these, and they're called 3D textbooks. And, uh, and so you can see here, everything you might ever want to know about a fish is in this, in this exhibit, which, if you're an ichthyologist, is very interesting but we found that a lot of other people don't find these very interesting. Um, and then, of course, um, in the 50s, well, really the 60s and 70s, there was a big movement for science centers. <clears throat> so really to change this whole idea of a museum kind of from a cathedral to a shopping mall, okay? That's really kind of this transition. We know people like to shop. They like to browse, they like to try things on. Can we make a museum based upon that premise, okay? And so the exhibits were very different, okay? You could browse around, you could hands-on, interactive in some cases, and, um, and so science centers became very, very popular, okay? And they're in many ways they innov very innovative and often very, very engaging for children, okay? Who wanted to touch things, press the buttons, pull a lever, you know? And so this was a, a, a big innovation, very big challenge for natural history museums. How do natural history museums deal with this sort of, this interactive exhibit mo movement? Uh, the Bell Museum wasn't entirely um, uh, left out of that because we actually created the first discovery room in the 1960s, the touch and see room. And so here's a place where very innovative, all people were very, at the time, were very, in fact, people still are, you know, you just throw all this stuff out there and people, let people touch it and wreck it and, you know, and, you know, and that kind of stuff. So it's a place where we have real things, not plastic stuff, real specimens from nature that you can actually touch you can lift up, you can feel how heavy they are, you can compare them to each other, and uh, you can actually bring out live animals, like can touch a snake. And so this was very innovative, and no labels, okay, no labels. <laughs> and of course, media. You know, uh, when Diorama was first created, if you wanted to see all the different environments around the world, you could go to the American Museum of Natural History and, and go from diorama to diorama to do that. Well, if you have TV and you have nature movies that show you all that, 
that sort of undercut some of this, the value of those dioramas. And, a source, and so museums have incorporated a lot of media in, in their exhibits. And how do you do that? How can you make use of that in a way? So back in the 1980s, the Milwaukee Public Museum, which was very famous for its dioramas, uh, and of course was trying to deal with these same issues, created this rainforest diorama. Any, has anybody been there and been through that? A couple people, okay. So this was a very innovative exhibit where the idea is that <coughs> they, uh, they had some real things in cases, they, but they, most of the environment was artificial, low light, and it was like you walking through the rainforest at night and you were discovering things. And uh, it was, had some interactors worked in there, um, and, but it was what was considered, it, what's called an immersive experience. So he had the feel, really feeling of being in that environment. And very effective. And so it was a, a groundbreaking uh, uh, exhibit. So uh, this idea of creating these immersive environments, so you really feel like you're in, a di in that different that place. Um, and then, you know, very simpler things of trying to create that sense. You don't have to cre create the whole e exhibit like that. This is the Field Museum. They took some of the very oldest dioramas, and just simply by bringing elements of the diorama out into the visitor space, and some very simple interactive labels like flip books and things like that. This is done again quite a few, uh, quite a long time ago. They actually dramatically improved the visitor attention and interest in the dioramas and effectiveness of the dioramas. And then, of course, there was a revival too of this whole idea of having a collection-based display. There is something amazing about seeing all of those things on display. And they realize that, you know, that is really one of the things that museums do. We, we preserve this incredible record of diversity of life. And so how do you get that out into the public? And so this is a, uh, uh, it's called the Spectrum of Life Wall. It's in the Biodiversity Hall at the American Museum of Natural History. And they just took out all these models, all these old things that, a lot of stuff that probably people have been wanting to throw away for many years and <laughs> put it up on the wall here. So these old models of plants, actually these are herbarium sheets here um, and, and other things. And they go from you know, bacteria on one end to uh, I think insects, insects on the other end. So uh, you know, uh, not people, okay. So <laughs> but it, it, it gives you this whole spectrum of life and very effective. And, and, again, and they also incorporated some media at that time, some, some film, video here, some basic touchscreen type stuff. I, in fact, it wasn't touchscreen, it was, but some interactive media uh, there. And we have, of course, tried to do some of this at the Bell Museum in our current location. So we have like the bog, walk-on bog, which is very, it kind of gives you a sense of being immersed in this bog environment. It's very experiential. You have a different kind of sense of what it is to walk on a bog. So we've played around with these things at the Bell, too. And, and one of our more recent experiments, our test, was again, we're trying to test some of the ideas that we want to do, say, in a new museum. And so here again, we have the moose diorama, but we bring the moose antlers out into the visitor space <clears throat> and have the, the, the visitors pick up those antlers in front of the moose while they're watching the moose, feel how heavy they are, look at them, look at the texture, relate the, that experience that they have, that tactile experience they have there to the diorama. So it's not really, we're not trying to fool them that they're in that environment, but we're having these elements pulled out into that, that have this inside-outside experience. And then the other challenge, the other challenge is how do we make these? We are a university natural history museum. And one of our objectives is to show current science, okay? And, you know, people, you know, these are dead dioramas. They're depicted a pretty good type, time, and place that may not even exist anymore. You know, how do we... How do we present current science and change and uh, uh, the dy dynamism of nature? And so we added this touchscreen as a test, and there's some very simple interactives that you can, can use to kind of search for things in the dioramas. But you can work your way into that, <coughs> and you get into these videos of, of university researchers who are dealing with issues 
that involve the moose. The moose, in fact, moose are dying out in Minnesota. So why are moose dying out? What are the factors that, that impinge on the moose population? And so you can then sort of meet a, a researcher uh, through this interactive. And we've done evaluation of this. This has dramatically increased the effectiveness of the dioramas, just adding these few things to it. And so this is, uh, you know, the conundrum that we had. How do we make, <coughs> um, you know, these dioramas are great, but the way they're presented at the Bell Museum is so s sort of stuck in time and rigid that it's very, very hard to do uh, uh, too much in terms of the creativity around them and how to really make a new museum. And after, I guess, a lot of effort trying to think about how we could change the museum in its current location or add to the museum, which we couldn't really do in its current location, we finally decided that we needed to move to a new museum. And so what I want to talk about a little bit, and again, how do you make that, even if you had a, an interactive experience with an interpreter, with the dioramas, for the walk-in visitor. How do you make that interactive for the walk-in visitor and more engaging? So, <clears throat> so I'm going to go through some of the uh, some of the things we 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 toyed around with, okay, in rethinking the the Bell Museum and the dioramas. And we worked with a number of external um, designers and consultants. You know, we're part of the university, so you have to do all, a lot of planning, and you have to have conferences, and you have to have meetings, and you know, on and on. And um, so, and, and a lot of, you know, look at all the possibilities, okay? <laughs> and we really looked at all the possibilities. So this is one of them. How do you, and this is one designer said, well, we're gonna, we're gonna like jazz up the dioramas. We're gonna make a theater presentation out of these. You're gonna sit down, and it's gonna, you know, lights and mirrors and, you know, lights will come up and on, uh, you know, sort of make a media production about it. <clears throat> so that's one of the ideas. Uh, this is another on the same vein. Okay, we call the, in the museum field, these are called object theaters. So use the diorama as an object theater. So they have little spotlights on things and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so we decided we didn't like those. Um, uh, we also... Um, had somebody said, well, how do, we, how do we show the dynamics of nature, okay, in kind of a diorama? And so we spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, there are some, these major um, dynamic features like a prairie exists because of fire, okay, in Minnesota. And so could we sort of create a, a scene where you sort of were enveloped in a prairie fire, Okay, so here's a little theater, diorama theater. You go in there and you get burned up in a prairie fire. It's probably kind of exciting, don't you think? At any rate, um, so, and, and actually I kind of designed the shape. <laughs> we were, but at any rate, so it, it sort of, and then we said, well, what could we do in the next biome? Okay, like the, you know, well, oh, we can get swept away in a flood. Okay, okay. <laughs> so we can have the visitors get swept away in a flood. And finally we said, well, you know, People are kind of fearful enough of nature. Uh, maybe we don't want to do this, you know? So, so we, we can that idea. Uh, and then here's another idea we came up with. So what if, we, you know, we took this beautiful maple basswood forest with all these wildflowers, and you had to view it from a window of a suburban house under construction. You know, so here's like, <clears throat> you know, what everybody would li love to do, right? Wouldn't you love to look out your window at that? But you know, of course, you can't really do that. You know, to build this house, you would destroy that environment. And uh, so, you know, to, to get at some of that, um, that tension, and you know, some of that is good, but we're probably not gonna go that quite that far with the dioramas. So that was another idea. And of course, the other thing, <clears throat> so one of the things we kind of ended up, this is, we made models. Uh, this is not the current model. And, um, but it's a good picture, so I used it here. But the basic, the idea is <clears throat> the dioramas will be included with other exhibits, but inside the glass, we really want to respect the artistic and historic and cultural significance of the dioramas. We want to restore them to the best, to look the best they possibly can be, to work the best in terms educationally, to protect them long-term, conserve them, to light them properly, 
<clears throat> but outside the dioramas, we want to create a, a different environment. We want to be able to still have people be able to appreciate them and in a contemplative experience. We don't want to totally overdo it, but we want to be able to <clears throat> have a little bit more interactive, a little more feeling that you're actually in the place that you're exploring. And you have, so it's not just one experience. Because right now we're sort of a one experience museum. You look at the window, and you go to the next window, and look at that window. So we really have to have a variety of experiences. <clears throat> so that's kind of the, the basis of what we're doing in terms of planning for the, how we're going to interpret them in the new museum. Yes, inside, we're preserving them and restoring them and protecting them. Outside, we hope to create a more effective learning environment for them. And so here's a picture of the new museum. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a, uh, <clears throat> a preview of the main diorama and or the layout. Has anybody seen these? Some of you may have seen. We have some of these up so or on the website. <clears throat> but just to give you a little, it's on the St. Paul campus. This is Larpenter Avenue, Cleveland Avenue here. We'll have parking so people can actually come to visit us. OK? <laughs> Isn't that, that that'd be nice? And then, um, and, and, and when there's a, a football game or a basketball game, you'll actually be able to get even close, you know, you, close to us. So, and then uh, you'll come in here. We have some outdoor space, not as much. Eventually, we're going to get those seven acres of space down here to do outdoor exhibits. <clears throat> but you'll come in here. There's a, be a big lobby, planetarium, okay, which is a big uh, cylinder in the center. Temporary exhibit hall, touch and see room, classrooms here. <clears throat> we have a little bit of staff space here. We're kind of our this is our little cubby holes here. And then we go. The visitors will go up the stairs to the second floor. So one of the challenges, and so this is let's just give you orientation. It's shifted orientation now. So Larpenter's right here. Cleveland is here. So that's east that way. This is north. <clears throat> and one of the things we decided to do differently, we are working with the Gallagher and Associates as an exhibit design company. <clears throat> and they're very, uh, the trend now is to, traditionally you'd have a museum that would be di divided up by topic areas. So we have a planetarium, we wanted a, a space, an earth and space gallery, okay? And we wanted a paleontology gallery, or we wanted a, a area where we're gonna talk about university science that might be a driven to discover gallery. That was what we had been thinking. And we threw all those things away, sort of, a little bit. <clears throat> Can we invent a storyline that would tie all of these things together? Can we go from the edge of the universe down to Earth, talk about what makes Earth special so that it can support life, why Earth can support life? We talk about the origin of life, the evolution of life, diversification of life in this tree of life section. <clears throat> then we talk about the inner, this web of life. How are living things interrelated to each other and related to their environment? And, and then we, ha we want people to imagine a future because we know right now we're, we're many scientists are talking about the Anthropocene. So a new geological era in which humans are now the dominant force on the planet. And so the future is, to a large extent, what we do to it, okay? And so can we take some of the lessons learned here to imagine a future? So that's kind of the general outline of what we have for the, for the, the main gallery. And most of the dioramas, since that is the, will go in this web of life section. But I'll just give you a few things. So that why Earth is special, you walk into that space, you have a sense that you're out in space, and there's the Earth hanging above you. Okay, so that's kind of the major first impression that you get. <clears throat> and then in the in the um, the Tree of Life section, Minnesota actually has some of the very earliest life uh, evidence of life on the planet is here in Minnesota. The Iron Range is actually those iron deposits are largely the, the result of the early uh, cyanobacteria. Okay, almost two, th two billion years old. We also have some of the oldest rock. So we'll, we'll be taking a very 
Minnesota view of this. We'll, so we'll have some fossils, etc. And then we end that tree of life with sort of this ice age, the end of the ice ages. And so we're using, one of the things the architects gave us, which we were initially were not very happy with at all, was this 90 foot long wall that was 20 foot high. And there are two of them, okay, with daylight flooding in, which makes it a little difficult to create dioramas or exhibits, you know, all this light fades things and breaks things down. And so at any rate, so we're trying to, <coughs> um, we're trying to present them as kind of dioramas, or at least this one, where you'd be able to look at them from the outside, okay, look in. And what would be big enough <laughs> to see from the outside? Well, how about a woolly mammoth and a glacier? So this is, this will be a, the end of the ice ages, 10,000 years ago. The glaciers are receding. We have this um, uh, moraine in the foreground with woolly mammoth and other megafauna and kind of a spruce forest coming the other end. So that's kind of where the tree of life ends. And then the dioramas will be, um, again, the exhibit itself will be much the same, but there'll be more interpretive material on the sides. And each one will have a, a small touch screen. And that will, will so be using technology to allow people to explore that and encourage people to explore that diorama. So there'll be search activities, They'll, all the identification activities will be there. There'll be a little video that will set the scene, that will show you sort of what happened and then leave you off at the diorama. And then ho eventually, hopefully, we'll be able to dive down deep enough. You'll, you'll have people talking. You'll be able to get uh, videos of people doing research on issues that surround that diorama. So um, there'll be other sort of hands-on and other exhibits. This is not current. So don't take this any of this literally, okay? <clears throat> but around in between the dioramas. And then the way we're arranging the dioramas is very different. And so you'll come in and you'll be able to look at one diorama at a time, but you'll always be able to see the next diorama down. And from here, you'll see that diorama. And so it hopefully will allow people to focus their attention on one diorama, one set of experiences at a time and then move on to the next area. So that's kind of one of the innovations. Yeah, a question? Okay. Um, they're, they're, we're, they're arranged in three biomes, North Woods, Prairie Savannah, and Big Woods, Big Rivers. And so in each biome, there are three large dioramas, okay, and then some smaller dioramas. And one of the things we're also going to do in each of these dioramas is that there's a theme to each of those, sort of a biological theme. And so in the big woods, this is the first diorama. This is also the first environment that came in after the glaciers. Okay, so the first of our current, our, our current biomes to form. So it is a, tr it's a, it's a, uh, it's a walk through time as well. And we'll focus in on <coughs> how to make a living. So this is one of probably the most difficult environments to make a living. And that, of course, deals with predator and prey, food webs things like that. So that'll be the theme in that area. <laughs> when we move into the prairie and savanna, we have the elk diorama, which shows an elk uh, bugling, a male, bull elk bugling. And so we'll have a big rack of antlers here, talk about mating displays and competition. We, talk, we have tons of nesting birds, nesting animals, so it's raising a family and finding a mate and raising a family. And then the final section, I guess I don't have a, a, a floor plan of that. In the big woods, big rivers, it's seasons, cycles, and systems. So we're talking about how to build a community in that section. So each one has, has kind of a section like that. So hopefully people will be able to still come, see these dioramas, appreciate the beauty of them, and, and use them as these windows to nature, as these windows into appreciation of nature and study of nature, and, um, but still do it in a way, have it uh, interpreted for current and future audiences. So that's our goal. And I'm gonna kind of leave it there and ask for questions. So I saw a hand right up here in the front, first of all. How will you move these very fragile installations? Okay, how will we move them? I am sort of, it was, it was kind of bait and switch here. I'm sorry about that tonight. Um, we have, um, <coughs> we've, We've been investigating this for a long time as well, okay? 
I personally have visited every museum in North America that has moved dioramas, okay? Uh, I have worked with, uh, 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 visited many of these where they're in process of moving the dioramas. I've consulted with the people who have moved the dioramas. Uh, it has been done at other places. None of them are exactly like our dioramas, okay? Uh, so we have some unique challenges that we're facing. And so uh, what we've done was assembled probably the leading experts in North America to work us on this with us. And so we've pulled together these teams of people um, and they are, we did a test move on two dioramas this time, January and February last year. So if you go to the museum, there are two dioramas that are not there anymore. <coughs> the um, doll sheep diorama and the beaver diorama. And we said, you know, can, how, you know, can we, and so we tested moving the foreground and the delicate plants, the wax plants, with the beaver diorama. So they had, a, they had kind of a process of how they're going to do that. So they went through that <clears throat> to see how, how it's going to work, how many will break in the process and have to be replaced. Okay, so we have a good, good handle on that. So this is one of the older ones. We feel those are probably more fragile than the others, okay? So we have a good handle on that. And then the other, the doll sheep, how do we move the background walls? And so that went through a long process of the ones, we have some dioramas in the museum that were moved from another building into the current museum. They predate the museum. And in those cases, they, they peeled the canvas off the wall and re-glued it. And in the process, did a fair amount of damage that had to be re touched. And so what we decided, we're not going to peel the canvas with the jaquies, and we're going to move the walls. So we're going to move the walls, and there's a whole process of how to do that, because we don't can't, you can't crack them. They're plaster walls with a metal lath. And so there's a whole system worked up in terms of building a steel framework to support those walls in order to move them. So, okay. Uh, how are those ones that you're going to take out whole fit up and down the stairs and out the door. <laughs> well, we have these magic shrinking pills. <laughs> uh, I they, moved a museum, I know better. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, um, they came in in pieces, so we can, and much smaller pieces than we intend to take them out in. So there, we will have to open up the sides of the museum on both levels in order to remove the walls, yep. I'm gonna head right over here. Are you going to be um, making any new pieces? Any new pieces, new dioramas? Yeah, well really that, that woolly mammoth diorama, that's our kind of new diorama. And so that is kind of a, and the idea there, we've, we've played around with this before, a walk-in diorama where the visitors are kind of part of the picture Okay, so you'll be seen from the outside walking around in that diorama. So you kind of are part of the picture, that's part of the, the theme, and it will be, it's not going to be, it'll be more suggested than literal in many ways, in some of the background and the glacier and things like that, but the woolly mammoth is gonna be amazing because it's gonna be a, like a, re, it's not gonna be a skeleton like I showed, I should have said that, it's gonna be a, it's going to look like a real woolly mammoth right there. Okay, I'm going to head over here. Thank you so much for your time. That was a wonderful speech. Um, you mentioned the long windows. Yep. By the, did you ever ask the, the designers why they wanted the big windows, or did you just kind of, <laughs> <laughs> did you just kind of make, it, make it work? Uh, <laughs> um, Yes, we made a lot of stink about it, but it wasn't going to work. Didn't help. So, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was essential to the character of their beautiful design of the building. So, yeah, yeah. There's um, there's been some compromise. Yeah, there's been some compromise. Oh, I'm gonna pass the mic right down here, and then I'll head over into that section there. I, I was curious if any dioramas didn't make the cut for the new museum for scientific reasons or curatorial reasons. Yes. We're not moving all the dioramas 
There's 16 large dioramas in the current building, and we'll be moving 10 of those. And those are selected uh, as being all of the Jaquies dioramas are moving, and, and then we're, we're saving one of the older ones, the best one, the beaver diorama that represents that earlier style of diorama making. And so we have a record of that earlier time period, and then we have the, the kind of the primo dioramas from the peak of diorama uh, uh, creation. And that was really one of the great things, because really Jaquies came to the Bell Museum in 1940 at the peak of his, his career, and it was really the peak of the diorama era as well. And so we really want to save those. And then we'll be saving and repurposing parts of the dioramas that we don't, aren't moving as whole things. And so they will show up in other ways, okay? Uh, and you know, I don't know, can you talk a little bit about, I just think it's fascinating, but some of the, some of the challenges that are inherent in the dioramas as they are right now, I think of the Pipestone Prairie and the glass. The, 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 the diorama glass. Oh. Or not, I'm sorry, not the Pipestone Prairie, the, the, Heron, uh, Lake. the Heron Lake and the diorama glass. Yes. Yeah. So this is just kind of, I think, a little bit of context, for example. Well, we have several dioramas where the water is glycerin. Okay, it's, a, it's kind of a witch's brew of glycerin and and <clears throat> formaldehyde and a few other preservatives and gelatin or whatever cooked up. <clears throat> and then they would just pour it in and let it gel around the stuff. And it was kind of an interesting way to do it. And so when they moved it, these were dioramas that moved. They took it apart in pieces, put it back together, and then like poured another layer on. <clears throat> and um, we want to salvage a lot of stuff out of that Heron Lake diorama. But we know that gelatin, that one over time, the inside of the glass fogs up on that diorama. And it only fogs up in the summer. So it's, it gives off some kind of a, a hydrophilic material, okay, that gets stuck on the inside of glass. And then in summer, at high humidity, it fogs. <coughs> in the winter, it will clear up. Right now, we have cleaned all the insides of the glass about a year ago, so to try to make them look as good as possible. So we know we have to get rid of that gelatin somehow. So, and, um, and then all of the stuff has to be tested, you know, because they use various preservatives, uh, arsenic and things like that, here and there, you know. And so, <clears throat> luckily, it's not as bad as it could be. You know, a lot of places, everything was made out of asbestos and arsenic and, you know, mercury and <clears throat> lead and cobalt and everything, but, you know, we've got some of that, <clears throat> but it's not so bad. Thank you. I just, I feel like that one kind of illustrates some of the need that's involved and, and how some of those decisions were made as well. Yep. Um, uh, hands over here. I'll pass this over. My question relates to one that was asked over there, but I was concerned about if all the dioramas were going to be moved, and it already I know they aren't. What are you going to do with the ones that aren't moved? Yeah, <clears throat> for the most part, we will salvage parts of them, okay, to reuse. And so the mounts, some of the plant models, for example, some of the plant models, are the ones that we aren't using, will go to replace plants that might get damaged in the ones that we are moving, okay? So we'll have those as backups, and, or ones that we know we need. We know we, we know need those. Uh, some will go into a different kind of display. So rather than you look, it'll you know it'll be a kind of a walk around environment. So they'll be um, be used. Now there are there may be a small some of the small and medium sized ones that we may want to try to find new homes for. So as we finalize that, we'll be looking for other places that might be able to take them. But it's a it's a challenge because we have to <clears throat> because some of these do have arsenic like on the mounts. So we can't just give this stuff away because you have to protect it from people touching it. And so there's a liability issues there. And so we have to be very careful about how we dispose of them. Um, are there any mistakes in the dioramas that will need to be <laughs> corrected uh, with new research? Yes. And knowledge? Yes, there are. And, and 
Um, but not anywhere near as bad as many other museums, okay? <laughs> this is the, you know, that Jaques and Breckenridge got it right most of the time. And it's really pretty remar remarkable. But, you know, one example is the bear diorama, okay? And it's supposed to show some place on the North Shore. We're not sure where. It's kind of a little bit, kind of a made-up space. And it shows one bear catching a fish in the stream, okay? And there's no record of a bear catching a fish from, except on, on the West Coast, okay? It's the only place that bears catch fish, like where they have really big runs of fish like that. So, uh, so, um, so that's probably a blooper. There's also two families of bears together, which is probably not going to ever happen, okay? So that's another blooper. Uh, so there's a couple bloopers. Yeah, there are a couple bloopers like that. But that's pretty much, that's kind of, and the one that, the, the, um, the doll sheep was kind of the classic diorama of the old school. Well, not even old school. It was the family portrait trophy mount diorama where you have the majestic male, submissive female, the ch baby, you know, all in a family portrait. You know, kind of the paternalistic view of nature. And of course, these animals don't live in family groups. And so that was one that we weren't going to move because of that re reason. And they're, they were also the only non-native right. animal to Minnesota as right. well. Okay, right over here. One of the things I so enjoy about looking at the dioramas is the more you look, the more things you find. I mm -hmm. mean, the, the small details and whatnot. It's like a, like a treasure hunt. But now coming here tonight, I understand there's other stuff I haven't seen, which are those, those add-on images by Jaques in the background that are... Okay. Well, can you tell us more about that? I've never seen them. <laughs> <laughs> there's one looking at you right here. There's a gnome in, painted in the background of this diorama. And um, it's... Uh, no, can, <laughs> They're all in Don's head, guys. <laughs> Okay, so it's a little, probably a little hard to show it, but if you go there, you see this tree in the background? And you know, a gnome has a pointed hat, right? Bushy beard, bushy eyebrows, okay? That's the taxonomy. Taxonomy. Characteristics this is of the, the yep. characteristic, identifiable characteristics of a gnome. <clears throat> and so if you go down this way, right here, you see this hat, pointed hat, there's bushy eyebrows right here. His nose is a little squished. He's got a big bushy uh, uh, mustache right here and a beard right there. So, it's, uh, so if you go to the museum, you'll be able to see it. It's very clear. <laughs> very clear. <clears throat> well, Doesn't everybody see that? You don't see that? Anyway. I w uh, several years ago, we do, as you guys, many of you guys are familiar with our resident artist research project. And, and um, just a few years ago, we worked with a local artist named Andy Doucette who follows in the tradition of Mark Dion in many ways, and actually has worked and collaborated with Mark Dion, uh, who is the, the fellow who did the kind of contemporary um, critique mm -hmm. of a diorama, if you will, or used a diorama to do a contemporary critique, depending on how you look at it. And Andy uh, really latched on to Don's gnomes. And so in front of this diorama, he set up, he took a public call for garden gnomes. He collected them. <laughs> And he had them protesting outside of the diorama for like recognition for the gnomes in the dioramas. <laughs> so they have been honored. They have been honored in our in our artistic there are tradition. There are at least two more. There are at least two more different two other dioramas that have little creatures in them. So Wh oh, which one's done? Can you the, the Sandhill Cranes and the Maple Basswood Forest? So that's a challenge for everybody. <laughs> they are going, yes. Yep. Yes, the and gnomes will be preserved. <laughs> and we're not going to paint out the gnomes, right? We're not going Do we have any other questions for Don tonight? We are, oh, we oh, plenty. Great. <laughs> I'll be right over there. Sorry. There you go. Over the years, I've really enjoyed your temporary shows. Mm -hmm. um, you know, photographic exhibits or things about food or Jim Brandenburg. Will your um, new museum have the capacity to have those same temporary exhibits? Okay, temporary exhibits. 
So will we have temporary exhibits in the new museum? And yes, we will. We, and it'll actually be a better space than what we have right now. We have two galleries, two different galleries, a small one and a somewhat larger one. And they're at opposite ends of the museum right now. So in the new museum, we'll have actually about the same total amount of space, but they'll be contiguous with each other. So we can combine those two galleries into a larger space and we could take larger shows. And right now, we are in the process of selecting the two first shows that will go into the new museum when it opens in the summer 2018. And um, we've got some really exciting uh, exhibits to choose from. So they'll, go one, they'll each go up for six months. And then at that point, we will hopefully start creating some uh, exhibits of our own that'll travel, as well as bringing ones in. So, and can you just describe what uh, Brandon? Speaking of Jim Brandenburg, Jim Brandenburg. Yes. Who that is? Well, who that is? Yeah. Well, Jim. Well, Bra everybody know who Jim Brandenburg is. Some of you may, but he's a Minnesota nature photographer, very well known. Uh, worked for uh, for um, National Geographic for many many years. Traveled all over the world. He, he recently he's been doing a lot more video work, okay, and has uh, he has this um, uh, website you can sign up and get a little video every day. It's called Nature 365. Sign up for it. It's so wonderful. Every day you get this video that's about a minute and a half, and it's just this, it's like this little touch of being out in nature for that little moment. I actually save them up because it's not enough. So I, then I look at like four or five of them at a time, otherwise, yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and um, so he's working with us on a part of the new museum. So he's gonna be working on uh, a video production for us, uh, for the new building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, uh, another question right up here. Um, last time I was there, I noticed there's some exhibits that are kind of bequests or given in memory mm -hmm. of. Are there any kind of like legal requirements or you know kind of implications <laughs> around that and moving and maybe not having them? Okay, yes. You should notice that at the, each diorama has a little brass plaque that uh, that uh, talks about who sponsored it when it was first created. We're not going to throw those away, but um, I, we're not sure. There will be a whole wall of credits somewhere. Well, actually, we know where it is, you know, and. Uh, we actually, those plaques won't be at the diorama because we don't, the way the wall is going to be made, there isn't that, spa there isn't that space. The glass is actually going to be in a little bit. I don't know. It, it, we're not sh sure how we're going to figure that out. But So we're not resolved, we haven't quite resolved that yet. I actually have two questions. One, how about the indoor garden space? And two, what's the empty bell going to be used for something, I hope? Okay. So the first question was the um, indoor garden space. So if you've been to the museum, there's a little gap between the addition done in 1960s uh, and the rest of the museum. And that was actually intended to be an aviary at first. They actually had live birds in there. And, um, but you know, we decided we weren't going to be a zoo. And so we kind of took those out. And it, we struggled with that space. It's very hard to keep plants in there. And then we got this curator, George well, uh, Weiblin, who, you know, he's, he's done a number of presentations here, who had this living collection of figs. And so we tried to upgrade the lighting, and he's kept his living collection of figs from around the world in there. We tried to create this rainforest, and it's kind of it's turned out pretty well, you know. And um, so he's, he is going to move most of those to uh, some of the greenhouses on the St. Paul campus. And one of the things, one of the advantages of moving to St. Paul campus is we can do programs with some of these other facilities on the St. Paul campus, like the Raptor Center, like these, these um, um, research uh, greenhouses that some have really phenomenal displays of plants and, and things like that. We will have an area of live plants in the touch and see room, in the new touch and see room. And um, so that was a question about the plants. Oh, in the current building, it's there's no decision. It will be repurposed by the bell, by the music university, but what exactly we don't know yet. They haven't made any decision. I was wondering if you if there's a pause in the questioning or we're kind of winding down. Mm -hmm. If you could just share a couple of little diorama anecdotes. Um, we I was talking with one of our guests tonight 
earlier about, for example, the moose and um, oh. sort of the story of the moose and why it is the way it is in the diorama, aside from the aesthetic of, you know, it you know, being an active participant. Okay, in this should I try to get should I try to get back to the moose Sh image here? Sure. Actually I I have a moose here later on. There we go. Okay. So, th th there is some st funny stories about this. This was, again, done in the 1940s. <clears throat> and um, they, uh, they had a permit to shoot one moose, okay, for the diorama. And they were going, they were actually hunting up north of Red Lake. And there was a normal hunting season on moose at the time. It's not anything particular. But they, um, <clears throat> and they, the party divided. And one of the things that I, one of the great things that I overlapped with, with Walter Breckenridge, okay, he was, he had retired by the time I came to the museum, but he lived till 100 or 101. So there were many years that he would come into the museum and I could collect information from him. I wish I collected more, but this is one of the stories he would tell, okay? And he said, okay, we're up there. He saw this moose and said, no, the antlers are not big enough. Let's look for a better moose, okay? Well, <clears throat> people in the other party shot the moose, okay? So <clears throat> they, were, they were stuck with this moose. And the moose is actually, for Minnesota, it's actually a big animal. It's like, I think, 1,600 pounds, which is big for a Minnesota moose. And they said, well, but, you know, look how the antlers aren't really all that impressive. And the other guy said, oh, just put another rack on there, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> and Breckenridge was a stickler for, for authenticity. And he said, no way. This is a specimen. This is, a, you know, part of our coll scientific collection. So those are the antlers of the moose. So he didn't, he didn't fake anything. And so it was a young moose, a big young moose, but the antlers weren't that big. So that was the first problem. But the other problem is they, these, di these dioramas, the building that we're in doesn't have very high ceilings, okay? It's only 12 feet from floor to floor, okay? And so the dioramas, the glass there, the window is not that high, right? And so if you put that moose up on, that, on, on the soil like that, he'd be... A, out of the picture, okay? He's gonna be out of the picture. So they, that was one of the problems. How do you, you know, bring the moose down so people could see it? And so they came up with this idea. He's walking through the mud, okay? <laughs> and so the legs on this moose are actually cut off. They would be below floor level. And so the, they're sticking down into the mud. And, um, you know, and Breckenridge did this great job of making that mud look really good. It's actually plaster. You know, how do you make plaster look like mud? He just did an amazing job. And he actually, when the plaster was, was before it set up, he took a sponge and kind of in like this. And, you know, and then, of course, painted it to look like mud. And then if, you, if you're there, there's, he has a lily pad wrapped around the, the one hoof that's up. There's a little, it's dragging a lily pad, which is just a great effect. And can you talk about the, just a quick uh, insight into the water in the snow geese exhibit? <clears throat> oh, okay. So that was another question. There was a thing about copper sheets that were um, with, with a zinc or a chrome plated copper plates. And um, that's, again, another innovation that um, I think Jaquies kind of brought to this, the idea of having this very low light, raking light over the landscape. Okay, so that diorama has lights over on the left side. And when light is at that low angle, the water can often be like a mirror. Okay, so you get this mirrored effect. And Jaquies knew this because, you know, he was a duck hunter, be out there at dawn, and, he, and that was kind of the effect he wanted to create. And so he, um, he came, I don't know, he or, Jay, or Breckenridge came up with the idea of copper plates, because if you put just like glass in there, it'd be too flat, be too smooth, where the copper plates, they could just get enough little ripple into it so it looks like it, there's a little bit of motion in the water. And so it's very, it's, and I don't think I've ever seen that done anywhere else. And that's the snow geese, the snow geese diorama. 
I it, it cap for me it's my favorite because it captures that low angle of light like you're talking about that happens in the in the fall <clears> late <throat> fall um, that is just magical when you observe it but I can't you know imagine how you would uh, try to yeah. capture it artificially <clears throat> and this is just about as close as you could possibly yeah. and one become. of the things they found out when they did that they couldn't put it right next to the background wall because then it would reflect the painting and so that's the area where they had to paint it painted over in oils to to remove that and of course then they realized it reflected the white ceiling so they had to paint the white the ceiling so okay i'm going to ask one you do, oh i've got one from right up here and then i've got one last one for you don is it possible that you could get public television or somebody else so that you don't have to spend any more money because i'm very excited that you got the money from the legislature funding for the new museum to document this amazing process of moving from uh, one place to another and, and refurbishing and all the amazing things you're going to have to do with the so, dynamics? So the question is, are, do we, uh, can we, are we going to document this process of moving them? And yes, that's already in process. We are going to document it. Is, and, so, and we're already talking with um, public television about having this be a special. So there will be um, that, that, all, that whole, all these steps will be. So, you know, we'll, as much as we can, we are going to document. Yep. Um, I also, along those lines, I feel like I should hand the mic back to Zan from KFAI to give a <laughs> shout out to some work that he did earlier this year. Uh, yeah, if you go to Mini Culture for KFAI, they have a, a SoundCloud page and other things where we do short form audio documentaries. And I did one, I guess, yeah, was it like about a year ago or so now? about the gray wolf diorama, which is how we all got to meet each other in the first place. It was a magical thing. My original idea before doing that was to do a long form piece about the move of the museum and <laughs> that kind of just drifted away into the ether. But we do, there is a piece out there at least uh, working on that. That's, it's a pretty fun story and it captures a lot about like what the Bell Museum has been in the past, you know, while at least uh, with students, with you know, the, the museum curation and everybody else. It's quite fun. Look for it. Good. <laughs> Thanks. And we also have, we actually have some uh, little bits on our, our, on our YouTube channel as well, um, Bell Museum uh, at, on the YouTube, um, that discuss the dioramas and more. In the, yeah. So I just had one last question for okay. you, Don. I know your voice is, is probably going to give it's out. Going, yeah. <laughs> but sometimes I think there are questions that people don't know they want to know. They don't know to ask them. So <laughs> I would love it if you would just give us a sh brief little biography of Francis Lee Jaques because Don literally wrote the book on Francis Lee Jaques. Literally, you can buy it in our museum lobby. <laughs> and uh, if you could just, you know, okay, here, talk a little bit about his life, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it, it's yeah, and it's um, um, he he um, born in Illinois. He, Family moved to Kansas. They tried farming in Kansas. And then as a teenager, he and his family moved to Minnesota, came to Minnesota actually in a covered wagon. And he walked that whole way. And they got as far north as, this is 1903, and they got as far north as Aiken, and the roads were kind of washed out further north from spring floods. And so they settled there. They built a log cabin on the, on the, um, kind of a backwater in the Mississippi River in Aiken. And his father was um, a really avid uh, waterfowl hunter and was worked as a hunting guide and also wrote articles for sporting magazines. And it was really, and Jake was, you know, so he, Jake was spent a lot of time hunting with his dad and would draw the birds that they brought back. And we have a lot of those drawings in our collection still, which is really cool. And, um, and he tells a story about how he spent so much time drawing a pair of these that they spoiled. And he got in trouble because he, you know, he wasted their food. And, but at any rate, he, got, um, he actually illustrated some of his father's articles. And you know, he had only his formal education was at high school in Aiken, Minnesota and otherwise was self-taught and um, you know, worked on his artwork while doing, being a lumberjack, worked on the railroads, on the iron mines, was drafted in the First World War, worked in the shipyards in Duluth, did all these other things. You know, he, uh, he eventually became a commercial artist, 
kept working on his, his artwork, studied with an artist in Duluth, and then sent a couple of his paintings of, again, ducks in flight to the American Museum of Natural History in New York in the 1920s, and they recognized that he was like one of the very few people who actually knew how ducks flew and, and could paint them correctly. And so he was hired to paint birds and paint birds in flight and, di and dioramas. And so, and so this is before high-speed film to be able to get the, and so his experience of just being there, seeing them, hunting them, was trans, you know, he could transfer that into his paintings. And so, um, you know, then was, you know, all of a sudden was on these expeditions to Panama, to the Bahamas, to South America, and many of these were with, you know, anthropologists and ornithologists and this whole crew of people. So he was thrown into this wonderful mix of, uh, you know, uh, of people at the museum, artists and scientists. And, um, and so that's how he really, you know, uh, got started, and then he, he married, his wife Florence uh, was a writer, and so they published a lot of books together where she would write the book and he would illustrate it. And so, um, uh, and he illustrated about over 40 books. And um, so, yeah, very interesting guy. Very, very interesting. What was that? Bell Museum Dioramas. Okay. How did he end up at the Bell? That's okay. the question. Okay, how did he end up? Actually, it's another interesting story because <clears throat> when James Ford Bell, you know, he, he finally got matching funds to build the current building from the, um, uh, the Works Progress Administration, okay, in 1930s. This was a Great Depression program by FDR. And so it wasn't matched by the state. It became federal money. And so the building was built. He went around looking at dioramas elsewhere. And he decided that Jake Weiss was the person who should paint these dioramas. And so he was worked, Jake Weiss was at the American Museum of Natural History. And his boss was very jealous of him. And they did not want to let him go paint anywhere else. And so they wouldn't let him come, take time off to come to the Bell Museum. And so James Ford Bell apparently had to make a visit, personal visit to the director at the American Museum of Natural History and worked out a deal. <laughs> and so Jake Weiss would take time off, come out to Minnesota, and he would usually do about two dioramas at a time. So he spent a couple months, work on those two dioramas, go back to New York. And eventually, you know, tension between him and his boss got too bad, and so he quit, he retired. And then he, and he was still lived in New York for most of the, fo into, into the 50s, but he would then come out periodically and paint the dioramas. Uh, when was he born, was the question. 1887. I just wondered if you could give us some information about Walter Breckenridge. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so Walter Breckenridge, who again was the, he primarily did the foregrounds with Jaques, and that was the team, although Breckenridge had a whole other life and a whole other career as well. And he came to the museum in about, in the 1920s, as a preparator, a taxidermist. And um, uh, I also will tell you, one of the things I should say, we're actually also working on a history of the Bell Museum that will be published at the same time we open the museum. Okay, so a lot of these, we're incorporating a lot of these stories in there, trying to preserve some of this record. And so T.S. Roberts, who was a very famous ornithologist, was the director, and their interview was a, a birding trip. They went out birding, okay? And so that was his test on Breckenridge, whether he could identify his birds or not. And so Breck um, worked on the dioramas in the 1920s. But again, the big dioramas were done in, the old, in that earlier museum um, in the 1920s. And then he worked on a lot of smaller dioramas. He also went on to get his master's and PhD at the university. Uh, and so he studied both birds and reptiles and amphibians. So he, had a, he was the first person to do a real survey of reptiles and amphibians. And then he also worked on, f on making movies, while, uh, movies about nature, and was very famous for this, and very, very, did a lot of early filmmaking of uh, p uh, particular birds and mating displays of particular birds, nesting behavior. And so he continued that throughout his career and then also did artwork. So a very remarkable person. 
Thank you so much. Now, I would be remiss to let anybody leave tonight without saying, first of all, a huge thank you to Don, of course, our speaker. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to say a couple of thank yous because it is the end of the calendar year. And of course, we will be back in January. Uh, but it just feels like the end of the year is the right time to say thank you to uh, some of the amazing people that make Cafe happen all the time. Kyle, who produces our uh, podcast and sets our speakers up with tech and helps all that kind of stuff happen. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> Um, Aaron Hoffmeister has been volunteering at CAFE and a number of other Bell Museum programs for the last six years at least. So thank you for being our host, our co-host. Um, a huge thanks to, thanks to the Bryant Lake Bowl, of course. I have to say thank you to Barb, who's up in the sound booth, always making sure things sound good and that the lights come up and down when we need them to. <laughs> and AJ, our fabulous server, who is working this room while there's a talk going on and taking care of stuff, which is pretty challenging, I imagine. <laughs> and, uh, and finally, I want to thank Andrea. She's here tonight, too. She's our communica in communications at the Bell Museum, and she gets all the word out to you all the time on the Facebook and the Twitter and the website and everything else. So thank you, Andrea. That's why you know about CAFE. <laughs> thank you guys for being here. That's the biggest thank you of all. So have a happy, joyous new year, and we'll see you in 2017. <laughs>